history, religion, family, and technology. Focus on Liberia uncovers and showcases the best of Liberia and shows the world the truth about Liberia. We educate, elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We conduct interviews, panel discussions, debates, and more. Tune in to Focus on Liberia on Facebook and YouTube and be a part of the stories that make up the news. This is Focus on Liberia and I am Dennis Jack. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of the History Channel, with, of course, the presenter is Paul Yeya. Paul, welcome to the yeah. show. <laughs> he is water, right? Yeah. It means, actually, it, 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 it's not the same as water, but it means uh, good good intentions. Of good, course, good intentions. Good, good heart. Call you, yeah. Call you, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Yes, so let's say. The good-hearted <laughs> one. <laughs> Th th thank you for in tonight's edition of the history channel we're going to be looking at two presidents and these two presidents serve two times okay they serve two times they serve left office came back and serve again so they are in a very special category so we're going to be talking about them tonight we've been going through a series of presidents of liberia and so tonight we're going to be talking about two presidents Joseph Jenkins Roberts and James Sprague Payne. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think I think James Payne, I think he was out of gravel or crew because pine. In, in, <laughs> be somebody who was rich. Don't get confused people here. <laughs> well, or, or we may want to adopt him because his name. I think, I think I adopt him. All right. Well, let's see if you want to adopt him after the show. <laughs> okay, and then we, <laughs> let's see if you still want to adopt him. <laughs> But we're going to be talking about Joseph Jenkins Roberts and James Spriggs Payne. The These original political are, cartel. Uh, that, that's something else you're talking there, but let's get started. <laughs> Call again. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So uh, we, we've been uh, going through, we're on a journey looking at the president and always like to uh, remind people that are in Liberia, where I went to school, and I always like to mention that, you know, very good student too. So I studied in Liberia from ABC all the way to college. And we did not do much of in Liberian history. The presidents, we memorized their names without even any context. And uh, this is true for many of us that grew up and went to school before the war. After the war, I don't know what it looked like now, but that was the situation. So we are now doing a, a series on the presidents of Liberia. We've been doing other series, other things we have been discussing. For now, we are talking about the presidents of Liberia. After the presidents, we're going to go somewhere else. So that's why you should keep watching. And uh, there have been various suggestions called. People say, oh, this has never happened in the history of the country. Can you reduce this to books? Some say, can we do an audio book? Some say, can we transcribe it and write it? All kinds of uh, things have been suggested to me. What are you hearing? Well, I mean, people want people to write things down, but the fact is the stuff is written down <laughs> and people don't read. So I'm doing this you know, to try to inspire people to read what is already written, especially when it comes to uh, primary sources and, and, and things that uh, for more scholars to be inspired to do research. There's more to Liberia than what um, what we've been told. And it is my understanding, you know, through this journey that a lot of our story, our, our history, our, our le legacy, our heritage has, I mean, the legacy of our founding fathers, the legacy of our ancestors um, has been intentionally buried, disregarded, and even distorted. Uh, and, and the truth the truth is very powerful. The truth gives people a, a place of direction. It gives you context. It gives the present context. It gives you a, a, a understanding of how the world came to be organized the way it is. And you know, the more you know, the less you say things like, oh, since 1847, 
It be that is as they did. You would never say things like this um, if you really understand uh, from whence you came. That that is that is very important, Carl. But the only thing that I uh, that I think is that when you say this stuff is already written down, it's already in books, it's already there. I'm telling you, I went to school in Liberia. I didn't see it. So did people in mean, have to hide it from me, or what's the problem here? They do. I mean, how many books did they give you in Liberia? So here's exactly. the thing. We have, this is the information age. We have access to books now. And as we've said repeatedly, that you know many of these books are being digitized. We are working to digitize things that libraries are not doing on their own. Um, it's an expensive and slow process. But even what's available right now is just so rich and so, you know, there's just a lot. So I do a combination of both. I look for things that are already digitized. I also visit libraries. I, I dig through archives. I order things. I spend a lot of time and money doing this, as you can see. But the the real the real the real issue is it needs to be the story needs to be told. Right. Um, and the historians uh, need to, or those who want to study history, uh, those students who are interested in getting PhDs in history. I uh, need to focus on Liberia. They need to focus on, you know, the dissertations on Liberian topics. Um, and the government has a responsibility, yeah. and philanthropic organizations have a responsibility to sponsor scholars to do research. So yeah. my role is to share what I learn uh, and hopefully inspire people to do more research. Great. And, and you use two words, you know, digitize, you know, order and all these things, right? Well, mm -hmm. if you are in Bhutan, or you are in Yahweh Mesra, or in Baye, you don't have access to those things. So, like uh, you said, it depends, you know, rest on the Yeah, it's cheaper. Print, print, you, you do have access to those things, actually. If you have a cell phone, you have access to digital books. They're far, they're free for the most part. Um, and if you don't, tech, actual books are extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. This is, we have in Liberia what we call the technology jump, right? So we don't have physical brick and mortar libraries. Your cell phone can hold hundreds, if not thousands of books, depending on how much memory you have. Right. Uh, so I don't, I don't, this is 2022. I don't buy the idea. Look, our people. No, no, Carl. Uh, you, maybe you're talking Morovia. I'm talking, I'm talking Buto. I'm talking Crockery. I'm talking. I mean, you mentioned Yawa Mensa, where my uncle Gus Dolly did come from. They get right. cell phones here. Yeah, cell phones <laughs> they have cell phone service. They have electricity at all. <laughs> yeah, but so who's gonna who's gonna leave their who's gonna buy their how they call it megabyte and want to uh, spend that on researching? But that's I mean, story. if you're interested in it, you will, right? If you can buy di uh, data to listen to, you know, Prophet Key, then you can buy data to read a book if that's what you want to do. You have a point. We want to welcome yeah. our viewers from across the globe. And uh, this is time now that you take your pen, you take your book, you take your paper, and let's uh, take part in this discussion. We're going to open the phone lines very early on so that we can have this as a discussion. Because what we try to achieve here is not to come and uh, and solely teach you. We want to be able to uh, think about these things in a different way, share ideas, and begin the discussion so that... Uh, by the help of our presenter, point you in the in the direction that we can go and search for these materials and read them and enrich our lives. Uh, I learned something, you know, studying about like politics recently. That uh, take for instance the people that are voting. I mean, even if you are running and you don't know about the president that came before you, so you are not even able to look at their policies and see which one you can build on or who you can copy. Or you, who you can learn from, and if you're a voter, you are not a, even aware through civics the functions of a president, the function of a legislator, the function of a judge. How do you, you know, go and vote for these people if you don't understand what they do? So we have a lot of work on our hands. You know, all the talking and the politics and the G's and the fries not going to cut it. Welcome to focus on Liberia, where we educate. We elevate and promote all things Liberia. God, let's get started in this one. Let's start with um, Joseph Jenkins Ravels and James Briggs Payne. Why? How are these two uh, leaders different 
for me, I said this stuff two times. I mean, this privilege, right? To be president right. twice. You are president, you leave office, you do something, and come back and serve again. Wow. Not many people have that opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a shady, this was a very shady uh, time in our history. And it's funny because many people that I speak to are under the impression that Liberia only had one political party until 1980. And it's because most people don't know anything beyond Tubman. You ask anyone alive today to tell you about any president, they'll say, oh, Joseph Jinger Roberts and the jump to President Tubman. They really don't know what happened between 1847 and, and 1944 when Tubman took over. So their, their parents or grandparents who were alive when Tubman took over, some of them themselves were alive during Tubman's era. And so this is almost the extent to our memory in the country. It, it's, it's so absurd that we don't even, we even have a misconception of what the earlier presidents looked like, many of whom were photographed, and we still don't know this. So... The, the reason this story is important, and the slideshow is really short, but the reason it's important because this is a story about political ideology. This is a story about an ideological divide between the people who established the Republic, the citizens of, this, of, of the Republic of Liberia. There is no ideological divide today. There is no complex political thought um, that I'm hearing from political parties or, or political leaders today. But these people had very clear uh, differences in their belief system and how they thought the country should move forward. By contrast, and I'm, I'm emphasizing this because by contrast today, what I'm seeing is people who all agree on the same thing. They just think that one person is more competent to do the same thing than the other. So there's no ideological divide today. The, the, the only divide is who, not the how and not the what. So back then, these people were far more politically sophisticated than we are today because the divide was based on the how to do it and what needs to be done. I hope that's clear. I'm not hearing you, Dennis. That, that, is very, that is very clear and that is uh, very profound because uh, I think we, we just did a, a show on the other side about political ideologies, about plans, about platforms. What do our leaders have today to present to the people has an ideological difference? A uh, couple of years ago, I wrote an article on my blog which said, what distinguishes Liberia political parties? Just faces? So if you want to talk about the differences between political parties today, the names you, the, what you hear has the clear distinction of who's the political leader or who's the standard bearer. It's exactly, it's about the competence of the leadership, but the goal is all the same. They all say they want to do the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and you know, so in this particular case, they were more politically sophisticated than we are in the sense that their world views were actually different. So it wasn't even a contest of competence and say, oh, this person's more competent to lead than you are. They were all competent to lead. They were all very educated. They were all very well prepared. That wasn't the issue. The issue was what needed to be done, what was the direction the country needed to go in, and how they were going to execute um, these steps. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is political sophistication. I wonder what changed. <laughs> we'll yeah, blame, we'll blame it all on Tatna until we get to Tatna. That after, because from from growing up, growing up where we have the dominance of the TWP, so the political ideology then became, you know, one party state over one democracy, or you know, they're doing X Y Z. So when that was removed, now there is like there was nothing to talk about again, except people. Well, yeah, so the, there's, we've talked in past episodes about the miseducation of Liberian people, the brainwashing through the curriculum, the disinformation campaign, well-documented um, effort to kind of crush the intellectual um, development of Liberians, of, of Liberian people um, through the education system and just, you know, 
it was it was it was, it was intentional and deliberate. We've talked about it over and over again. But at this period in time, in the the, the late mid to late eighteenth century, um, I'm sorry, the mid to late nineteenth century, the eighteen hundreds, uh, there was a clear um, understanding of Roberts and his group of people about how they needed to move forward with the country and who needed to be allowed to participate in the progress of the country, um, the, what their relationship with foreign powers should be. There was a huge disagreement on that. There's no disagreement on that today. Everyone, everyone, including the sitting president and all opposition leaders agree that America is the be all to end all of our, of our common sense and everything else. And we need to bow to America for everything. This was not the case in the mid to late 19th century Liberia. These people had, you had the, the, the establishment party on one side uh, pandering to uh, uh, the, 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 the United States and the, and the Europeans. And then you had the, the, the Whigs, the true Whigs on the other side, uh, putting like the interests of Liberian people first. And, and not pandering and wanting to basically sever um, the economic dependency and be fair trade, equal trade partners with Europe as opposed to being um, you know, exploited is really what it was. And uh, the, you know, the more conservative establishment people uh, were more focused on, we need to be exploited because we don't have the power to do anything else. If we try to stand on our own, we will be crushed which was also a very legitimate concern. So you have to think about what this word conservative means at this period in time. You know, conservative actually, if you're living during a period when there's still chattel slavery in the world or you're just, the world is just emerging out of chattel slavery and you are African people, what exactly are you trying to conserve? Yeah. What are you trying to conserve? It should be the question. So if you're conserving a relationship that has been abusive and exploited, then you are probably, you know, going to have conflict with those who recognize the exploitation and abuse and want to stand as men. Hmm. So let's see how these things come into play during this period in our history. Yes. So we're going to talk, I mean, you can go ahead and read that, Dennis, and then I'll, I'll follow up, sorry. Right. So after an 1871 revolt against President Edward James Roy and Smith's second two-month term, Roberts returned to the presidency serving until 1875. Yes. So we have four episodes on E.J. Roy, so we're not going to get into... Uh, what I have, uh, you know, the, the coup d'etat against the, the 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 first true Whig party president. There was an open. It was a it was a coup, and it was it was in fact uh, a coup. And I would even go as far if if we're going to um, cite sources from the time. It, it was practically a lynching of 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 Edward James Roy. He was he was probably murdered. The the primary sources from the time period describe a scene and describe his body in a manner which would suggest he was actually murdered. Um, so when this occurs, Roberts, they, they basically set up an interim government. Hmm. E.J. Roy's vice president, Smith, which we, we discussed last week, returns to office to complete E.J. Roy's term, which was the remaining term was about two months. The reason for the coup was that they claimed to have been preempting Roy, who they said was not going to hold the election in the ensuing two months. So they were saying they were removing him to avoid the possibility that he would not allow an election. And he, I believe he was sub subsequently killed while trying to escape the country. Edward Wilmot Blyden believed this and many others who were alive at the time. Roberts then takes over 
in a, I would mm. call it a, um, under the pretense of an election, mm. which was orchestrated by the very wealthy and powerful members of the investment community, the ACS, and many very powerful, uh, what we would call sons of white men who were merchants. They were mulatto merchants in the in, in Monrovia. So this is where this whole idea of the mulatto uh, and, 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 and full-blooded you know, Negro divide comes in. It wasn't necessarily so that the, the Dunbars and the Shermans and these people were actually in government. They weren't. They were merchants. Most of the people in government were not mulatto. There were a few, but majority of the actual people in government looked like you and I. You've got Smith, you've got uh, uh, Roy, you've got uh, Stephen Allen Benson, uh, Daniel Bashil Warner, people who have been in later years portrayed as light-skinned mulatto people. But if you go back to the time period, they were not depicted as such and they were not referred to as such. And we've addressed this in previous episodes. So contrary to popular belief, this was not really a conflict just about skin color because there were also many mulattoes who helped to establish the True Whig Party. And as you can see, James Briggs Payne was not mulatto, as they tried to portray him as, based on the primary source. James Briggs Payne was a Black man who had the same ideological beliefs as Roberts. Payne was a, a pastor. He was raised in the church. He was raised, uh, he was a, a, I would call him almost a uh, Christian extremist. Um, very, very, very conservative. Um, believed that the only way for African people to have salvation was through um, the blood of Jesus Christ. I mean, this is what he espoused. This is everything that he spoke and emulated was about his faith. Right. So this, I, and, and at that time period, the way Christianity was taught it was taught to African people. It was not liberation theology. It was subjugation theology. And so these people had this understanding that it was a godly thing to do to cooperate with their oppressors um, and seek peaceful, amicable resolution to oppression. Right. Call, call that, that, that makes sense to me because I was... Born and raised in the church, right? But when you say Springs, P Springs was or uh, Payne was an extreme or extremist, I would say no. I would say he was a devoted Christian, a devout Christian. I wouldn't use extremist as a Christian. I'm using I'm using the word extremist because whenever you, if you're devout, hmm. that is internal. That hmm. is your belief. When you're an extremist, it is external. It is what you are imposing upon others. So that imposition takes it from being a devout, internal spiritual journey for yourself, and now you, you're turning into an, it becomes an imposition upon others. That is when it becomes extreme. That's the distinction in the language that I'm using. And what was that like for pain? Can you clarify the question, please? Meaning, was, how was pain doing that? Because he was president. And so some of the rules and regulations and, and, and uh, uh, orders, executive orders that you're passing about how people must conduct themselves, you have to remember they, the Christian population was in the minority at this time. Right. And so this idea that, that the citizens must adopt the religion and the way of life was also unconstitutional because the constitution didn't require that. That's but the true. ideological mindset of the, the establishment Republican party pushed it. The constitution allowed for religious freedom. It did not require that citizens be Christians. It did not require that to live within the Liberian territory that you're a Christian. But that was the idea that if you were going to live in the territory, you must wear clothes, you must cover your, you know, women must cover their breasts, you know, uh, people must conduct themselves in a manner that is um, 
acceptable for people who who mm. uh, who were Christian at that time. True. Even before the Republic, the AC had a rule against our drinking. <laughs> yes, and that and that rule continued. You know, you, you you were not people were not supposed to drink um, within the city limits. I mean, this is where these old vagrancy laws come from, and so you know. It was, it was, it was, um, and, and you have a, a population which is larger than the immigrant population of indigenous and uh, other African born uh, uh, immigrants, the African born immigrants being the recaptured Africans, repatriated uh, African born people from Congo Basin, uh, Dahomey, um, uh, Angola, and these different areas, and also indigenous people who were coastal people, and also those who were rescued from the various slave factories on the coast had their own belief system, their own spiritual beliefs. Their own, there were a lot of Muslims. There were a lot of people who believed in traditional spiritual beliefs that were not allowed to um, to conduct themselves in, in, in a manner that they were used to. They were not allowed to do their ancestral rituals, and these things were frowned upon and considered demonic. Hmm. I, I know they wouldn't allow us to dance Tukla in, in, in that place. <laughs> no Christians don't do that at that, that time, <laughs> right? So, so, so we, we talk about uh, uh, Joseph Jenkins Rabo became president the second time, and uh, something that you described, I call it in my understanding, a kind of quasi election that was held. I, I yes, wanted to walk through that. How actually he became president? You know, the, 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 probably yeah. Let, let's uh, let's talk about that a little bit more. So Roberts takes over the second term. He has no vice president. <laughs> he just it's just Roberts. <laughs> it's just Roberts. And the records are spotty. I mean, the, the primary sources claim that he was elected through the he was appointed through the legislature. Um, my 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 conclusion is that it was it was just basically a power grab and a very wealthy and powerful uh, influence. Uh, because even before uh, 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 Smith took over for Roy, this is what they wanted. And Roberts was, I have this this joke that I share with, with my friend, uh, Aomi Cassell. I tell her all the time, I'm like, you know, if power concedes nothing were a person, it would be J.J. Roberts. <laughs> because even when he wasn't president, he was in control. He was working with the militia. He was controlling. He had command and control of the republic. Uh, the things that people accuse uh, Madam Sirleaf of, that everything that happens in like, oh, that Omar did it. In, mm -hmm. in in reality, that was Joseph Jenkins Roberts when he was no longer president. He and was two of, and still two commanding. Of them, two of them are mulatto, so I think she, she learned that. Ellen, Ellen is not mulatto. <laughs> Ellen Ellen is, 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 is a child of a mulatto person, but she's not mulatto yeah. herself. Okay, yeah. Mulatto, but, mulatto, actually, these terms are so outdated, but since this is a history yeah. show, in context of history, mulatto meant that you were half white right. and half black. Right. President Sirleaf has a African parent and an African mulatto parent. So she's not mulatto herself. So this is what I know of Roberts. And this is why throughout my uh, high school days, I have held Roberts in high esteem, right? That this mm -hmm. was a man, I mean, he worked so hard fighting for our independence. Now the country is being, you know, we have to really fight. And Robert played a key role from being governor, now he's president. This man served the country. He left power, you know, he was defeated and left, something that is hard to do today. He went into private life, you know, work, you know, like not sitting down and saying, oh, I'm ex-president. He went and, and worked and went to, into business. And then when the country was in chaos, he was kind of asked to come in, and he came back again to uh, to serve, which was like, please come and save us. So I grew up, you know, really uh, appreciating Joseph Jenkins Roberts. From what I'm hearing from you, it's not a case. This was he was actually part of the coup d'état against or India Roy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this this was this was calculated, and it was he was the mastermind. He was the the czar of Liberia. <laughs> uh, but you know, this being said, he was being motivated by a belief system. 
he was being motivated. He was being, he was, he was, his, his actions were inspired by an ideology. His actions were inspired by an ideology. It wasn't just about I'm taking power. Mm -hmm. It was these Negroes are taking the country in the wrong direction. They're going to piss, excuse my language. They're going to, you know, get everyone angry. Um, they're going to pee everyone off, right? They're going to, the, 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 the European uh, uh, traders are angry. The governments are going to get angry. And Liberia is going to be unprotected. And they're short-sighted and ignorant, and they don't know what they're doing. He believed that he had the wisdom and knew how to balance their situation. Almost like having your head in the lion's mouth. You don't just pull mm -hmm. it out. You have to pet this lion. Yeah. You have to pet the lion. So his idea of, of he, he was looking at Roy He's like, this guy's got to go. He's going to mess around and get us all killed or colonized. You know, he's going to get us all destroyed with his radical ideology. Here he is, uppity, building ships, competing with Europeans foot to foot. The Europeans don't want to trade fair trade. Okay, I'll get my own ships. Yeah. Uh, Chief, you know, Chief uh, uh, Tia down on the coast in Sino, sir, when you get your ivory and all your goods, you're ready to trade, I will buy it. I will take it to New York. I will take it to Liverpool. And all of you guys are just as human as the people who are coming here to trade. You have the same rights to self-determination. You are men, not unlike those who are coming from Europe. So they do not have a right to exploit you. We're all going to prosper. And it was too, it was too radical. It was too right. soon. And it terrified really? it terrified these people and, and, and another caveat to that you have this mo this this class of liberians the sons of white men who are receiving a level of privilege and respect because of their lighter complexion from the europeans who prefer to deal with them exactly because they can see and this is one of the the you know those divide and conquer tactics right so you have these sons of europeans when the traders come in and they want to negotiate, they're going to be talking to Roberts. They're going to want to talk to Sherman, General Sherman, because General Sherman basically looked Irish. They're going to want to talk to Russell. They're going to want to talk to the people who they are more comfortable interacting with. And so they brought this color caste system and exacerbated it by giving better treatment to the lighter skinned people in right. the settlement I mean, in the country. And something that I, I really didn't pay attention to, like uh, which is very clear to me now, is uh, for two months, you know, E.J. Roy is being disposed and uh, probably killed. You have his vice president serving for two months. How possible is it to put an election together within two months for a president? So it was almost impossible for uh, J Joseph Jenkins Roberts to have been elected in a free, fair, transparent election. Two months, that's too short. It, it, it wasn't. It clearly, it, for me, just looking at the evidence, it clearly wasn't. But he felt that he was, he, he thought he was saving the state. Yeah. In his mind, with his belief system, he thought he was saving the state. Is there any points intended because we have another team the state among us today? <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole the, the, the whole idea of saving the state, it began with Hillary Teague, Elijah Johnson, and all those people in 1847 when they raised that flag. And it continues today. The struggle has always been to save the state. The struggle continues. <laughs> In 1871, there were 6,100 Liberians of American origin resident in the entire republic and about 50 well, export trade had so grown that it amounted to $50,000 yearly. The population of Monrovia is said to have been 1,300. The country's public debt at the beginning of that year was but eight thousand dollars yeah let me let me read that again 
1871, there were 6,100 Liberians of American origin resident in the entire Republic. And about 50, the export trade, I don't know, but you can correct that later, had so grown that it amounted to $50,000 yearly. The population of Monrovia is said to have been 1,300. The country's public debt at the beginning of that year was but $8,000. Yes. Yes. It, these numbers are important. So what I left off there, um, I, in, which is where, um, the fifty. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 that's my bad, Dennis. My version has it, but basically, so the 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 Liberians of American origin. This included the few recaptured Africans who were actually who actually made it to um, the United States and were returned, and African Americans. The, re the recaptured Africans who never made it to the United States, who were rescued directly from sea, are not included in that 6,100. Only those who came, you know, from ships that actually made it to either Key West or Georgia and places like that, and then were released through tribunal back to Liberia. So the African-born recaptured Africans that made it all the way to America were returned. The African-Americans who were returned through the various colonization societies and um, I guess that's basically the, that total number was only 6,100. However, you had about 50,000 citizens on the coast who were indigenous Liberians and recaptured Africans who were part of the, the Republic. That number does not include those living outside of the control of the Republic at the time in the Northern Central Territories, which were still autonomous at this period in history, politically autonomous, and in fact, very little interaction with the, with the Republic beyond trade. Hmm. And that population was presumed to be somewhere, I don't know how true this is, but at that time and how they were able to project it, but they thought that there was somewhere around, uh, there's one account that says there's about half a million, another says there were about a million people in the hinterlands, but the land area that can, they considered the hinterland pushed well into what we consider Guinea today and into part of Sierra Leone. So and, this is... And, and Carl, before you go to that, why, mm -hmm. why is it that the, those numbers are very important? Is it, is it that uh, we are... Hold on, there's an echo here. Is it because we are leaving out a vast majority of the people that were not included in this census, if I may call it that way? It's not because we're leaving them out. I was I put in these numbers out because I wanted to show if you do, I mean, 50,000 yearly in 1871, um, mm -hmm. that was a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. Most of that was being generated by indigenous people. The beneficiaries of this were the European traders and then the their, their uh, allies within the Republic, the European and American traders and the allies within the Republic. And not just Monrovia. So that 6,100 people is spread from Robertsport all the way to Harper. So it's not just Monrovia. So I wanted you to know also that that 1,300 is and you know is 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 what Monrovia was right, in right, other parts right. of Monserrado up the St. Paul River, Harper, Greenville, um, Bassa, I mean, Buchanan, all these different places. Marshall, these places all had people of, of of American origin. So if you think about how that spread along the coast, that's not really a large population. Yeah. So you have to understand a lot of these senators, a lot of these people who had been educated even before independence, were indigenous Liberians and they were incorporated in the state. Because there were not enough, there were not enough American Liberians to run the country, Liberians of American descent to run the country. So it is clear that the country was incorporated, had already incorporated a tremendous amount of indigenous, skilled and educated indigenous people. I, I mean, this is, the, this is the time period that produced this is just before people like Didi Botoy and these people were coming out. I mean, before them, you had uh, uh, Dosen and others. 
So there were a lot of indigenous people being educated along the coast and that were being incorporated in government in various positions. Well, I don't know when you say a lot of them were incorporated. There, and there was a greater number. There was a greater number than those of American descent. Mm -hmm. well, so that's what I mean by a lot. The people of American descent were outnumbered. And, and you say most of this uh, 50,000 was being generated by indigenous Liberian? Yes. What were, they, what were they doing? How? Farming, so agriculture. You had a lot of farm trade in, in cloth, trade in commodities such as oil, rice, uh, ivory, gold. Yeah. I mean, the before the, the Republic was established, this area was already an economic hub. Harper and especially uh, Robertsport and Cape Maserato. Hmm. We love that. And this is Cape Maserato? This is, the yeah, so basically this is a sketch from the time period. I love this because it shows how um, these mission buildings and everything was set up and how the integration between the, the indigenous housing with the Western style you know, homes, um, it's, it, it's just amazing. And I'm sharing it just to show that the population was being integrated even at that time. So I don't know who's looking at this on a large screen, but you have a woman with some with something on her head. She's wearing like a loincloth and she's got a baby on her back and she's topless. Yeah. What these guys wanted to do was make all of these people look and behave like themselves. And that is not something that you can do by, you know, there's only two ways to do that, either by convincing them or by force. But you, you can't be in a situation where the majority of the citizens see absolutely nothing wrong with being topless and you, you're, you're against it. They see absolutely nothing wrong with the way that they're living and you're against it. So the, the, the process of re-educating or reconditioning the minds of people began with children, putting them in the mission schools, baptizing them, Christianizing it, and then they would then turn away from the traditional uh, 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 culture and they would frown upon it and they would sever ties typically with the traditional culture and, and completely become Liberian, incorporated in the Liberian society and no longer, most of the time, no longer speak their dialects mm -hmm. um, and, and, and just become, become different, become westernized. Right. And uh, this was some of the ways, uh, even when I was born, that uh, we knew you were civilized, right? If you can no longer speak your dialect, right? So, yeah, and even the word civilized is a bizarre word. I don't like yeah. to use it even in the context of history. Um, I would say westernized. Uh, civilization, you know, Shekanta Diab always asks the question, is it civilization or barbarism? He has a book called Civilization or Barbarism. Uh, yeah. wearing, wearing clothing that you wear in cold climates does not mean that you are civilized. Let's uh let's 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 put some comments on the screen so that uh, our viewers can uh, can go along with with what we we're doing here. Uh, Wendy registered at last someone with clarity of thought about Liberia. Stella Jeffers said, "I need to be president of Liberia so I could tell America to go to." H E double hockey sticks. Uh, is it true that President Barclay came from Barbados in the Caribbean? Yes. Uh, Sally said, which native language was there in the public places in the land called abroad today for the English language? I'm not listening. Please just write it on my reply. I don't know. It was Mandingo language before 1822. History can never die. About 1.2 million in purchasing power today. I don't know what the reference there. Oh, OK. Uh, I thought there were some comments that had a, 
and religiously following the program. This program is very educational. All right, viewers, uh, let's uh, come back to the topic here. Uh, and, and please put in comments so that it can enrich the discussion. We're going to open the phone line very soon so you can become, be a part and uh, participate. Yes. Liberia's political distinctions and a system of party government bearing among the conservative-minded Liberian voters the name of Whigs or O Whigs, why the more radical or progressive section of the people call themselves the true Liberian party and Republicans. The term Whig, like Tory, came as a political nickname from England to the United States and from America back to Liberia. Ooh. This is this is uh, William Hurd's uh, this is William Hurd's uh, basically his his words and his explanation. Um, I don't necessarily agree that the True Whig was progressive. Um, they were very conservative. They were trying to keep the status quo. They were the establishment party. They were the party of ACS. They were the ones who believed in everything ACS was doing, and so on. So I don't necessarily accept that they were progressive. The true Whig party ideology in that time period was extremely radical and progressive because, again, they were talking about self-determination. So one thing, the, the main reason I presented this is because it's important to understand where these terms come from you know, everybody knows about the Whigs in London and, you know, um, the, the the Tory. So these are all old English political party ideologies that were transplanted to the United States with the British colonialism, I mean, colonization of North America, and then, uh, then seeped into West Africa, Liberia specifically. So we're talking about True Whig being one of the oldest political parties in the world one of the longest lasting existing political parties in the history of, of, of modern government, of, of political parties, period. So Liberia is so unique. I mean, the True Whig Party is the longest existing political party in the entire history of Africa. We don't really think about the contributions that we've had to political thought and the advancement of the cause of African people. Liberia gave birth to the whole idea of African people governing themselves in, in, in a modern context without a monarchy, without a strong central authority that was acting upon some divine or spiritual power like most of our chiefs were. Uh, we also had our people, the, the, our, our cloud uh, 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 crew, uh, ethnic groups, who had more of a democratic, uh, communal way of living. They didn't have strong central authorities. But the modern state, Africans governing themselves in, under the context of a modern state, not under an emperor or you know someone, again, that had spiritual powers, uh, this is, is the birth of it. And it's something that we need to discuss and we need to understand how profound that is and how much that impacted Liberia and the, and, and the world around us. Um, so we can go to the next slide. The Wicks in Little Days have been further differentiated as true Wicks and all Wicks. As the party, they desire to limit and restrain the rights of foreigners in Liberia and to preserve the commerce and land settlement as much as possible for Negroes. The true Liberian became the Republican Party. On the other hand, advocate a far more liberal policy which should admit strangers to nearly all the advantages of Liberia. So do you see that clear, concise, ideological divide? This is the easiest way to explain it. 
But, but they didn't know, or we're trying to describe it that way now. After the this fact. is what they this is what they wrote. This is what they espoused. This was their documented ideological belief. So it's not. This is not an imposition. In fact, um, whenever you heard Stephen Allen Benson when he broke away from the Republican and joined the True Whig Party, he never lived long enough to see the True Whigs become, uh, you know, rise to the presidency. Uh, but their mindset was Africa for Africans, really. And it was really um, about the trade benefits, the resources of Liberia being utilized by Liberian people. We talked in past episodes about Daniel Bashir Warner, who was a Republican, but he decided to become a shipbuilder because they were being, there was like an economic embargo, trade embargo against Liberia. So, but Daniel Bashir Warner, out of sheer necessity, they don't want to trade with us, so we're going to build our own ship. And we're going to go up and down the coast of Liberia and we're going to collect resources and we're going to have fair trade among our own people. So you've got the Grable Kings, you've got the, the Cruel Kings, you've got the Basa Kings, you've got the people in, in, in Cape Mount, the Vi, the Madingo. You've got all of these traders along the coast now empowered by ships that were built in Liberia by Liberians instead of having to do things on canoes or on the heads of, 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 of indentured people. Um, this was revolutionary. So Bashil was also, his mindset was starting to change. So when I tell you that the ideology is the reason people left the Republicans and joined the True League, and it was not just the Daniel Bashir Warners and the, and the Stephen Allen Bensons who were Black. There were also many, many mulattoes who did the same, including Russell, who was even lighter <laughs> skinned than, than, than J.J. Roberts. Russell was, was, was probably, you know, only, you know, a quarter or so African. But he also joined the True Wake Party because he believed in that ideology. But, but Carl, if you, if you uh, look at this another way, I it is not all that bad, right, for the ideology to be almost to be almost the same like we have today. And what differentiates us now is uh, just people not following that ideology. People just being, you know, bad leaders, right? So it it may have wiped out this whole ideological divide because nobody or the leaders we've been. Uh, lucky to have have not been following anything right so the idol and i'm using the broad brush here i may be wrong the idol so bad the idol so incompetent the idol so ruthless the idol so dictatorial so that's all we see and so the opposition to them is focused on that aspect and not mainly the ideological aspect because they are so bad they are not following anything they are following something though okay what is so that? Just because you're bad at, just because you're incompetent doesn't mean you don't have an ideology. Right? It's two different things. Competence is not an ideology. Right. They, you, they all believe the same thing. You don't know what you're doing. You, when you're incompetent, you're just doing a bad job at governing, right? Mm -hmm. You're doing a bad job at governing, but you believe in something. And the belief in, in what they all believe, they all espouse when they get up to give speeches. That's when you know what they think. When they go to the U.S. Embassy to interfere in domestic issues that do not re that before going to the Senate, <laughs> before going to our Supreme Court, before doing exhausting all of our legal mechanisms, running straight to the U.S. Embassy, even elected officials doing this in this day and time. No one is, is saying this is wrong because they all think it is the right thing to do. Because they have all, they've all ceded their, their dignity to the extent that they believe that they should be babysat or subjugated or controlled by a foreign country. Mm -hmm. If an American senator went running to a foreign embassy 
like the British embassy in DC and said, hey, this is happening here. We don't like it. Uh, Trump's interfering with our elections. He's doing stuff. Can you get, they would be charged, not even accused. They would be charged with treason. If a sitting American senator did what Darius Delon did in Liberia, they would be charged with treason. In fact, it wouldn't happen because they know it wouldn't be legal. It would be wrong. But we don't have a belief in even our own sovereignty anymore. We don't even respect our own processes. We haven't even tried to exhaust our processes anymore. And so when July 26 happens or any other holiday and or we have a, a, a program at Providence Island, President Wea, Mr. Cummings, Mr. Boykai, everyone that has political ambition, they all agree that we owe everything to the United States, including our sovereignty, because that's who they think. They don't evoke the names of the people who actually fought for our sovereignty. None of them did. Because, because they, they, don't believe they, they don't know, Carl. Not wanting to know is also an ideology. Not caring well, enough well, to know well, is also an ideology, is yeah, it not? Well, I mean, if, if you if you don't re if you, if your ideology is I I want to believe that everything we have we need to ascribe to the United States, and you and you focus on that. That's your belief system. Right. I, I said the same thing the other day that if you don't have a plan, that too is a plan. So so I agree with you. If you don't want to know, that's an ideology. I agree. So I mean, a lot of that again is the, the disinformation, the miseducation. So everybody thinks exactly the same thing. I hear all these politicians say since 1847. I, I mean, they say these phrases all the time. And so these guys, um, no, not since nothing is is like it was in 1847. You know, this is these people didn't think the way we think. This was much more. This was much more sophisticated. So now you had a situation where um, the true the true Labour like, Party, true Whigs. Um, didn't want to keep allowing all of these these foreigners to set up um, hubs, trading hubs. You have to remember what was happening at this period in history. Slavery was just being abolished uh, in the West. Liberia, you know, was struggling. They were trying to sabotage our trade for their own benefit and the benefit of the handful of, 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 of sons of white men that resided in Liberia. So it wasn't in the best interest of the majority of people in the country. And it was also against the principle and the value of the constitution that established the country, which was to preserve Liberia as an asylum for African people, an asylum for, uh, for, for, for the embattled uh, uh, sons and in, 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 in descendants of Africa who, who were being denied uh, the right to self-determination, including Africans living in Africa that were rescued from slavery and living in the vicinity of Liberia that were being oppressed so it was not in the best interest or, you know, so the true Whigs were also, in a sense, you know, you could call them constitutionalists and call them conservatives because they were trying to conserve the spirit that created the Republic in 1847. They were trying to conserve the, 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 the uh, belief system and the, 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 uh, the principles laid out in the Constitution. Like President Roberts, President Stephen Allen Benson was a member of the Republican Party for the first part of his career. But Benson afterwards went over to the Whig Party. Yes. So Benson crossed carpet, like we said today. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he didn't cross because somebody bribed him or promised him a job. He was already, a, he had been a Republican president. He didn't want to be president again. He crossed parties because of the ideology. And, you know, this is the second president of Liberia, a full-blooded African man, the second president of Liberia. He was a Republican, but he changed his ideology, he changed his thinking. These men were starting to understand and they were starting to believe that they could do things that others can do. And that they did not need to be treated as subordinate to other people. They believed in their own rights, God-given right to self-determination. 
So Benson broke away from Roberts and the Republican uh, mindset and wanted to strive to fulfill the, 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 the constitution of Liberia, to create, to because to, Liberia was an idea, it was a dream that had not yet been brought into reality. And their struggle was to make it what it was intended to be. What up, Benson? So, coming to uh, pain. Pain was stopped. Yeah. And as my, uh, pain was elected a sec to a second term time, Payne was elected a second time in 1876, again serving a single two-year term. Escalating economic difficulties began to weaken the Liberia's dominance over the coastal indigenous population. So this is another quote from Heard, from William Heard. So this is this is getting back to this whole idea that maybe these Republicans, as much as they were afraid to ruffle feathers, maybe they were wrong. Because what's happening now is Roberts and Payne have returned and they've created an environment where the indigenous kings that are trading are now being economically exploited again. They're not getting fair trade. They have now Europeans coming and just free for all exchanging with them at much less value than their goods are worth. These people are the bread baskets. These are the spice you know, bearers, the rice bearers, the ivory bearers, the gold bearers, the diamond bearers, the cloth bearers, you know, the calico they talk about, which is the country cloth that they wore, was extremely valuable and important to Europeans and Westerners. So we were bringing textiles and all kinds of things to the coast, and now we're being undercut because you've got these people who are not allowing, the Europeans are there, they're not allowing Africans to engage them in an equitable exchange. The relationship is, a, is, a, is one of exploitation and degradation. So while they're afraid to pull their head out of the lion's mouth, the lion is consuming them. And now there's, there's mummering and uprisings. And now the relationship with these autonomous people in the North is starting to shake. So maybe the true Whig party was correct. Maybe everybody needed to stand together. So you hear, we walk, talked about in previous episodes where, um, where uh, 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 I'm sorry, um, not Stephen Allen Benson, but uh, Daniel Bashir Warner talked about the need for everyone to pull together in the country, whether it be mm -hmm. recaptured Africans or descendants of African-Americans or indigenous people to pull together and form a solidarity and make sure that they had each other, to paraphrase, they had each other's backs against this pressure that was coming from the outside. So this is Daniel Bashir Warner, who was also a Republican, but his mindset was, shifting towards the true wig toward the end of his term. So at this point, majority of the people, the educated people, educated indigenous people, the educated uh, um, recaptured Africans, the, the descendants of African Americans, the majority of them, including many so-called mulattoes, were thinking along the lines of the true wig party. And this is really the reason why Brother Payne is the last, you know, Republican president in Liberia. Because their ideology was a failure. It was wrong. Hmm. Hmm. And it, it, the, the, the sabotage that we're trying to avoid, they actually uh, uh, escalated it and exacerbated it. Hmm. And I hmm. do need to mention that Payne actually took over because Roberts became very ill and technically died in office. I mean, he, he was very ill, was bedridden for the last two months of his term. He didn't have a vice president, so James Prince Payne basically took over to continue his legacy. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's what I was about to ask, because we have uh, Jim, James uh, Scurvin Smith after Roy for two months, 
as in 1872. So, so J.J. Roberts took over in 1872 to 1876. That's four years. Yeah. And, and, and Pink came right back, you know, 1876 to 1878. Again, so Roberts basically handpicked him to take over from him. Right. But he, so was, I, he was pressured out because his policies and Roberts' policies later were causing a lot of contention among the indigenous leaders. So again, there are no elections. This is hand and it, it was economic. It was economic. The tensions were always about economics. In the earlier years before Liberia was independent, it was about hey, you want to try to stop our 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 our, our economic oh, ventures here? We're we're, we're selling human beings. This is what we do. <laughs> we don't want another free town here, so we're going to fight you. And now they're getting to a legitimate trade. And they're being exploited, and the, they're not being protected by the the, the, the central government of Liberia. Hmm. And, and as I learned, if this is true, that most of these people were were business people. Even if you either have a business or you have strong ties with business people, so economic issues were at the forefront at this time. Yes. Payne was elected a second time in 1876. Again, yeah, we, we uh, again serving a single two-year term. Escalating economic difficulties began to weaken the laborers dominance over the coastal indigenous population. Hey, I see. I, I recognize yeah, somebody. <laughs> yeah, so there was a <laughs> there was a slide missing here. So this photo um, is you know, you have on the far left, the vice, at the time, Vice President uh, Talbert. You have President Tubman. You have uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And on the far right, you have uh, Secretary of, of State, uh, which is the equivalent of Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Mamalu Dukli. And I don't know who that is in the center with the glasses. Right. And behind them hangs a portrait of, of uh, Joseph Robert. Jenkins Roberts. And this is in the, the executive mansion. Oh, okay. I thought that was Hufwe Boyne, but no, the Hufwe, that's not Boyne. That's not Boyne. No, no, no. This is, yeah. This is a library. This is 1952. 1952. This photo was taken in 1952. Hmm. So Robert, <laughs> Robert is there. I mean, Robert is highly respected in Labron history. He's the first president. Every country's first president is highly respected. Let me uh, let me open the phone lines. We'll read some comments. Open the phone line. Take a short break, and, and then come back. But before we do that, let's see some comments here. Hmm. Isaac Harris, that's why I like this show. So educating. Most times I'm on these different Labyrinth platforms, I hear people talk about our founding fathers as though they have done nothing for the country. Younger Liberians have failed to build upon the foundation that the forefathers lay out for us. All we do is sound out their missteps but never give them any credence. Could that be the reason why we are heading in this downward spiral? Somebody, please help me. Call you can can you help him? Yeah, I mean, I think his observation is brilliant. Um, you can't be standing on the shoulders of giants and then decapitate them at the same time. You're hurting yourself, and that's what we've done with our whole, you know, move away from history and erasing our past and replacing it with just complete nonsense. Um, has caused a lot of problems. Countries, nations, people get their self-esteem from the past. Um, the past tells you why the world is organized the way it is. It tells you how you became who you are. And if you erase that and you sever that from yourself, you, you're like a, a tree without roots. Any little thing, you'll just fall over. So mm. we have to pull this back up and lay it on the table and present it to ourselves and our children and, and, and the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. It is the fact of what happened, and this is why we're here. But many of these people whose graves we, 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 we spit on, 
and 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 turn into Zogo, you know, uh, uh, smoking areas and you know, overgrown with brush. These are the people that are responsible for our land sovereignty. These are the people that, um, against greater odds, far greater odds than we face today, accomplish almost the impossible. Um, some of their accomplishments in the context of their existence in that time period were miraculous. If they can do miraculous things, so can we. If you want to join the conversation, please call 605313. 605313-6004. The code is 791403. We really want to hear from you. Let's make this very interactive as I read more comments. I don't want to read Mark is saying the same thing over and over. We are not. It seems as if the Whig Party had a progressive stance on economics. Uh, that's Michael McGarry. He continued, wasn't there also a political rift between the mercantile and the agricultural segment of old Liberian society? Oh, oh, oh. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. So, oh, you're gonna keep reading, okay? Yeah, Michael is the is. Um, he said the role of Liberia in coastal trade at the time made them a bit of a threat to the Europeans. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So when we were talking about the agriculture, um, and we're talking about the the traders coming in. Europeans were not coming to trade with Liberia the way they were going to go trade with the United States. Americans were not coming to trade with Liberia the way they were going to trade with Europeans. They were coming to Liberia to exploit Liberia the way they were exploiting other parts of Africa where people were not educated in a Western sense at that time. The problem that they faced with Liberia is that they ran into a literate, well-educated population. You had doctors, lawyers. I mean, we had, you know, Smith, who was a medical doctor trained in the United States, served as vice president under Roy. You had E.J. Roy, who was went to one of the most prestigious universities in Ohio before immigrating to Liberia. You had geniuses like Edward Wilmot Blyden. Um, all of these people, Roberts, these were not ignorant people. These were very enlightened people and educated at a standard that is even hard to, to find among politicians in modern Liberia. You know, educated to a standard that's even hard to find among modern politicians in Liberia. I want you to think about that. And so when they came with their shenanigans, for lack of a better term, they met resistance. They met men with dignity, especially among the Whigs. They met men with dignity who, who who offered them resistance and were able to legally argue for the correct taxes, for the correct trade value for goods that their citizens were producing. So yes, there was a rift, uh, but the rift again really is, it wasn't really about mercantile versus agriculturalist. It was really about those who were siding with the with the uh, the economic exploiters against the interest of those who were producing the wealth in the country. Michael, continue. There is an agenda to lambast black self-determination. Vilify our heroes, ancestors, and leaders is the order of the day. Cultural genocide at its finest. Afre Dennis, do we have anything that was used by our former presidents that we can display for people to see in the museum? And why Liberia does not have presidential grave site apart from pre tadma grave? And Tekun Dixon, this is the best platform ever on recent, on Liberia's past. Very informative. This lady is outstanding. And talking about the museum, I went in the museum uh, in the late 1980s, could be 87 or 88, and I saw, uh, you know, things from the past president. I saw Tutman, dining room table, his spoon, and all that. 
where the museum is today, I don't know. Someone in Liberia can probably clarify. Yeah, we have we have the museum in town in Morovia on Broad Street there. Um, there's a museum in Harper that was destroyed during the, the war. I don't know why they did that. It's just, you know, very stupid behavior um, on the part of, of people who didn't understand what they were doing. But we do need to, in the United States, there's a lot of money, uh, federal funding for museums and things, but there's also private funding. There's also private citizens that give to library projects and museums. And our government is already struggling with resources just to meet the basic needs of the citizens. So these are the kinds of things that under these circumstances, they really do need to be private ventures. People need to just do things um, because they, they're in a position to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. I do research because I have the, you know, well, some time, not a lot, but I, 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 I've sacrificed the time and I also sacrificed my own personal resources to be able to obtain information because it's my way of, of sharing what I'm already passionate about with my fellow citizens. And so it would be great to see uh, more people find ways in which they can uh, contribute to the advancement of, of the Liberian people. Um, without saying, oh, we've got to wait for government, or I've got to run for office to do this, or I've got to, you know, America became great because people volunteer, because people do yeah. uh, their civic, they perform their civic duty. We need to be, in order to get a better government, we need to be better citizens first. Carl, that is very important. You mentioned that uh, about volunteering, doing something, you know, like, uh, Man, I, I'm not saying this so that, you know, maybe you feel so. Oh, but before I continue on that, let me bring in one caller is on the line. And this caller is calling from overseas, even though the data there is not harmonized, but we need to uh, be very considerate. And that's our colleague, Ayumi Cassell. You're live. Question or comment? Um, just a comment. Um, hello. Good morning from my side. Thank you, Fisco. Thank you, Dennis. With all your platform, this will not be happening. Thank you so, so much. So, I so you, you say, sis, call, you don't say, Uncle Dennis? No, I'm <laughs> kidding. Go ahead. So, I want to say, Dennis, you are Thank you, thank you. Again, the number is on the screen, 605-313-6004. The code is 7914033 pound. Call and let us uh, and be your part. 
And it's very important to talk about volunteering and uh, people, private citizens, recognizing the importance of uh, these things. Like, for instance, you talk about a museum. We talk about history, what we're doing here. Uh, called to you, we all work. And I'm not saying this so that you can feel sorry we chose to do this and uh, we're going to be doing it. But call works and uh, to uh, do research is very difficult. We, you know, so the time put in there, that's a lot of time. I too, I work and to put all this together is work. If you notice, I'm standing because I work from home and sit down for nine hours to do work. So after that, to work for Focus on Liberia, take me another four hours. So if you sit down all day, there is, you know, those of you who've been sitting home, you will know what that means. But we put in the time. What if, I'm just saying, what if this was uh, what I was getting paid from that I can do more? Or if this is what uh, Carl is getting paid from that she can do more? Yes, said Women Research Liberia. I mean, people call me and say, why don't you have books? Why don't you have audio books? If there is money, if somebody who is give, who is going, and I'm going to take a, who is going to a group just for political reason, and you give them this number of thousand dollars because you want a job, or you work your entire 401k in Libra, you take it and dump it into the hands of people for political, you know, for a job that you may never get, also that you can get this job and steal. What if you say, well, I'm going to fund the History Channel? So that it can become more robust, so that we can teach these things. Maybe if we, are, if these things are taught, you don't have to suffer so much to win people over, to to bribe them to vote for you. If people understood what these things mean from our history, know the foundation that they are building on, what other people did before. You don't have to build a bridge, you know, even though it's going to fall the next day before they vote for you. If all of us come to the point of understanding these things, there's not going to be so much chaos. And uh, some you were asking, you say, well, why they broke down the museum in in Harper? I was I saw the wall where people there was uh, this light poles on the Somalia Drive, now the Japanese highway, and they were shooting them. And some say they they prepared to also break down everything so that we will build it from scratch because there was no understanding. I too have a philosophy that uh, before the war, if we were associating with one another, if we were having market days where, you know, the crown people, for instance, and the Gio and the Mano and the Grebo can all come together. If we had something that we treasure, that we value, that we wanted to protect. But when the war came, we didn't find anything of value to protect. We did not have a value system to say, oh, we can't let this happen. So this, we were able and willing and very happy to destroy everything because we, we didn't know better. So with History Channel, for instance, and I'm passionate about this, if we can teach the problem we're going through today, we may not. And they start from people that have a little bit of money investing in some of these ventures. That's my little pep talk, huh? I love it. That was great. <laughs> You need to get out of your soapbox more often. <laughs> right. I mean, look at the things people are financing in Liberia. That don't make any sense. Things that people yeah. are building. I mean, you take one house, you build it in front of your friend, you can't even get out of the house. The fence is reaching to the sky. You can take that and put that in the museum. Yeah. You know, I think you and I were talking when I said, when I went to school, I mean, how hard was it for someone to come to class with a ruler? to measure us, or a little skill, to say this is your weight. So all these things we did were all abstract. You know, conversion, uh, uh, three feet equal one yard. We never saw a tape rule. I mean, how hard was it to come in class and measure all the things that we do? Because there is no money. I'm not talking science. I'm talking basic stuff. But nobody is funding these things, and we think out of the blue, the country will just be somewhere. This is impossible. There's no country that goes anywhere without education. Let me stop. Go ahead, Carl. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with you um, 100%. Every country that, ha every civilized nation, when I use the word civilized, I mean, I mean civilized. I'm talking about people who've gone through a renaissance and treat one another with dignity and have ambition and self-determination. 
is, is deeply rooted and has reverence for their history. Every renaissance in human history has come from a reverence for history. History is the foundation of human civilization. We build upon the past. We don't start from scratch every generation. It is a progression of human knowledge and it begins in the past. All knowledge, all knowledge is rooted in history because mm -hmm. before you advance calculus, you, you know, you had, you know, your ancestors created basic mathematics. Yeah. And so everything is built upon the past. And if you destroy the past, you literally destroy the present. If you erase the past, you set the present back because there is no longer a foundation to build upon. The reason America has all of these museums, the reason Europe and, and all these advanced countries have libraries and museums and have so much funding for history and they have so much vested in erasing the history of people they want to subjugate. It's because they understand that they get their strength from that. Even by usurping your history and pretending it's theirs because they want to get the strength from your past as well. I mean, imagine in our lifetimes, in the modern era where people were photographed, not only sculpted, but photographed they are later on, shortly after their deaths, recreated to look like their fathers were white men. As they did with Stephen Allen Benson, our second president, as they did with Daniel Bashir Warner, as they did with James Briggs Payne. I mean, it is absurd what they've done. And every single person shouts the same mantra, Oh, we didn't have black president until E.J. Roy. And even the E.J. Roy man said it go paint him to look completely different than what he, he actually looked like. Curling his hair instead of his 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 picky, kinky African hair. And yes, Joseph Jenkins Roberts was 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 a, 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 the son of a white man. But that's not all we had. And he went to Liberia because he was African. He was not free to, to determine his own future, his own destiny in the United States. That's why he became Liberian. Not because he was a white man, but because he, he knew he was African. Even Roberts understood this. You know, these are the, the, the people who came from Barbados and went to Liberia. They knew they were African. They were just one or two generations removed from Africa anyway. You know, you've got Arthur Barclay, um, you know, whose grandfather was born on the continent of Africa. So these they knew they were African. They weren't confused about their identity. It's important because we say how representation matters and all this kind of stuff. If you don't know how many and, and how incorporated and integrated the society was, you don't see yourself in your own history. You see your founders and your ancestors as your enemies because you think that they were all mulatto or all Americans and no indigenous people contributed to the country until 1980, which is a tremendous lie and a travesty of history um, for people to think this way. But if you think that, you, you internalize it and you see no value. You see no value in your country or to yourself for that matter. And like Dennis, you know, to your point, this is why they were so comfortable destroying it. They thought that these things were erected by their enemies. All right. Uh, Carl, we we about to draw down. So we don't have uh, we don't have any more color. Where we go next? Uh, let me put the list of the president. And if you don't know already how to sing this song, Joseph Jenkins Roberts, please uh, practice from Joseph Jenkins Roberts. To George Manning Weir. There's a uh, George Weir is the 25th president. If we take into consideration the uh, interim or uh, the short term ones like uh, James Smith, like uh, Moses Blah, and that's what we got. So if you don't know already, please uh, learn to do this song. We all learned that in uh, ABC and uh, first grade. Go. Let's uh, let's let's wrap up and give us a picture of where we go next. So next week, Anthony Gardner. 
We're going to talk about President Gardner. Uh, True Whig comes back to power. That was a legitimate election. Um, when the, all the murmuring was going on, J.J. Roberts is now deceased. Uh, James Fricks Payne takes over. The Godfather, the the Czar, the the <laughs> the Don Dada of Liberia, the Big Tree, Joseph Jenkins Roberts had fallen. So the True Whig Party now uh, has their ability or the opportunity to take control, and the, their very first president. Um, in the continuous line, not their first president period, but the first president in the continuous line until Talbert in 1980 began with President Gardner. Um, so this is going to be a very interesting show. With Gardner, we're going to follow the same format. We're going to talk about his background, where he was born. I'm going to dive a little bit into his uh, genealogy. Um, one of the things I want to share with you is that the way we we do just basic gene genealogical research is um, if, if a person is born free, we look at their parents, were their parents born slaves? And if they were, what were their names? And then we look for the plantations in the vicinity where they were born, where the owners had those same names, because many of the African Americans would leave the plantations with the names of the plantation owner as their surname. And then we would then look at their slave records and look at their, because they had records for their so-called property, because these human beings were their property, we then would find and go on and so forth. So a lot of the genealogy of these presidents um, is, is what I do. And I don't do it too deeply, but I go back at least the generation to slavery. When I find a full stop, if I can trace it back to a recaptured African vessel or a plantation, I do mention it and say, hey, this person is actually the descendant of a recaptured African. This person can be traced to a specific plantation where there's conflicting information, like in the case of James Briggs Payne, where the record says one thing and he said another, I will present both. So I just wanted to make that clear that this is very meticulous and method, there's a method to it. And it's not just, you know, helter skelter. We, I have a methodology for, for tracing these people. The, the next thing is we'll then get into once we do a deep genealogy, we're going to talk about his accomplishments as, as president, and then we'll take some snippets of some speeches or some letters that he wrote and share. So please tune in for that. Please tune in right here on Focus on Liberia, where we educate, we elevate, and promote all things Liberia. We don't want to talk history, we also talk politics. Join me tomorrow at 12 noon when I will be sitting with. Ambassador Louis Garcia Brown, uh, he's a politician, he's a diplomat, a former student leader. He's a member of Team Cummings 2023. He's gonna be here to talk about his connection with the MPFL, his role in government as the uh, Taylor government, the Salif government, the are government. Now he's on Team Cummings and he has not been quiet. He's been writing and criticizing the current administration. We will be talking about all those. Join me right here tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern. And don't forget, uh, day, daylight seven time ends tonight. So 12 noon Eastern will be, we're gonna be having from the Eastern time zone, gonna be five hour different now with Liberia instead of four. So 12 noon Eastern time will be 5 p.m. local time in Monrovia, please. Don't forget to watch. We want to thank you, Carl, for always uh, volunteering, coming here to do this. We appreciate your time so kindly. And uh, please uh, continue. You know, uh, as we say in Madrid, the reward of a teacher is in heaven. So if you're <laughs> not getting paid, you're going to get paid in heaven. So. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we want to thank our viewers too for always being here. We want to thank our supporters. There are people who call us and say, you are doing well, thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey now is saying, thank guys. Uh, one of our uh, big fans here, Ms. Francis C. Wilson said, come on too late. So mad with myself, we'll watch anyway. You know, thank you Francis for watching. I believe this is, as you may say, this lady put so much work and time into this. There are nights we do not sleep. Now it is your fault to remain ignorant of our history. 
Take time with the people, are you man? <laughs> the information is out here, and these patriots, Dennis and Carl, are doing their part. Do yours to have a better Liberia, save the state. So, yeah, let those days to have a better Liberia. We have a, uh, and uh, every what wrong? We miss Evans today. He should be better. <laughs> but uh, so we thank our viewers for coming. At this time, we're going to close the show. And uh, we always end with our song that says, we are all Liberian. I believe this is by the uh, small town group. But it's a group in Liberia, I like them. And they sang this song, we are all Liberian. And I want to remind all of us that uh, in spite of your ethnic, religious, or political backgrounds, we are all Liberians. And that's the message we want to leave with all of us tonight. Good night and God bless you. We all love you, man. Is our home. Love you, man, people.